Throughout Advent, we await the arrival of Christ, the long-expected Messiah, Emmanuel, God is with us. In the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, 4, and 7 and 8, John the Baptist prepares us for Jesus' arrival. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of the, his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. To many, John seemed like a strange or even crazy man. He preached about things unknown, and he insisted all listen to his words. But really, he was proclaiming things Isaiah and other prophets had declared for thousands of years. As Isaiah said in chapter 40, verses 3 through 5, a voice cries out, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has broken. Are we prepared for the coming of the Christ child this Advent season? Let us pray. Holy God, you prepare the way for Christ's arrival. Prepare our hearts so that we might embrace him this season and always. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for that. Good morning. I'm, I'm, I'm not being unfriendly today. I'm just not hugging anyone because I have a cold. Okay, would you join me in our call to worship? A voice cries out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Every valley shall be lifted up. The uneven ground shall become level. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all people shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken.
Would you join me in our opening prayer? Merciful God, who sent your messengers, the prophets, to preach repentance and prepare the way for our salvation, give us grace to heed their warnings and forsake our sins, that we may greet with joy the coming of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Let us, amen. Let us pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. for our children's message. Come on down. I'll stand back a little. <laughs> well, good morning. Good morning. Everybody ready for uh, the coming holiday? Mm -hmm. sure. I want to talk today, today to you. I'm, I'm so glad the Advent wreath is right here. You know, <clears throat> this is such a great preparation for us to get ready for the com for, to celebrate the coming of Jesus. What a celebration this is. You know, it, it wasn't always. They didn't always celebrate Christmas. It wasn't until the um, fourth century, I believe, that they cel started celebrating Christmas. But do you think we ever get confused about Christmas? Yeah. What, what confuses us? Um, like the commercialization of it all. The commercialization, right? Well, it's a big money thing, boy, I'll tell you. I used to work in retail. It was a terrifying thing, you know, because people came and they wanted everything. They wanted. But back then, you know, you didn't have just a, a, a someone who checked you out. You had someone at each counter who asked you what you would like, and, and then you, get, you had to get what they wanted and give it to them. And then they paid you, not a... Uh, and, uh, and the... The cash registers didn't tell you what the change was. Can you imagine that? So I, <laughs> I was 16 years old. I had to count back money. I had to learn how to do that. I remember the first day I was there, no one told me how to do that. And this lady gave me money, like a $10 bill. And, and her, what it cost her was $7, maybe, let's say $7.50. So I'm trying to do 10 minus. <laughs> and I couldn't get it. So uh, then the, the woman that I was learning from said to me, count back to 10. Just count 50 cents. That's eight. A dollar is nine. And another dollar is 10. Anybody ever hear that before? Counting back? Yeah. Yeah. All right, you're set then. See, but they don't need you to do that anymore, but you're set if you ever need to. But I want to talk about this wonderful wreath. Do you know the, the names of the candles? Last week's candle was the first candle, and that's hope. The second candle this week is peace. Next week, the third candle will be joy. And then the very last candle here in the circle will be Love, and this one is called the Christ candle, and that's, we light that on Christmas. 
So I was thinking about the, the, how wonderful this is. Whoever came up with this really had to have been thinking and praying about it, not just about how to count money back and how to buy presents for everyone. Hope. Jesus brings us, brought hope. But you know how long they hoped for a Messiah to come? Long time. Isaiah, what the, I'm going to read from this morning, Isaiah talked about the coming of the Messiah 700 years before. Those were a lot of years, a lot of generations that came and went and didn't get to know that Jesus had come. So there was always the hope. That's what faith is about. We hope for things that we don't necessarily see right away. We're hoping and trusting God to do what he said he was going to do. That's a lot of years of hoping and trusting, isn't it? So, and we, you know, I don't know anybody who, you know anybody who's ever lived that long? You know, I don't know, I don't know if Methuselah may have, but I don't know anybody else. Then the next one, hope, okay? This one is peace. What, what, what's the name we call Jesus? One of his names. The Prince of Peace. The Prince of Peace. So they're hoping that they will have peace. You know, when, um, did you ever watch one of those, um, uh, I can't remember what the name of them, where all the women dress up in these gowns and they come out and they say, what do you wish for? What do they, what's their answer all the time? Has anyone ever seen? What is it? World peace. Wow, I, and they all say the same thing. World peace. Here's the thing. Only the Prince of Peace will ever bring peace. People haven't figured out how to do peace yet. Only Jesus knows how to bring peace. And then there's joy. You know, there's a big difference be, between joy and happiness. Happiness, sometimes you're happy because, well, you got this present. It's pretty neat. And in a few months, it's still pretty neat. But it doesn't bring joy to your heart. Jesus is the very author of joy. He puts joy in your heart whether you get a present or you don't. He's the source of our joy. We can celebrate him. You know, I always tell people, they say, what do you think about Christmas? Well, I think Christmas is every single day because Jesus is in my heart. So every single day is Christmas for me. And for any, any of you, you, every day can be Christmas. Because he was the best gift you'll ever get. There'll never be a gift like him again. The best gift you'll ever get. And then the last one is love. So important. People confuse love, you know. They really mess around with love. They don't really understand what love is. Love Jesus displayed love, showed us love. How did he do that? He came from heaven. Understand now, he was in heaven, the perfect place to ever be. He was in heaven with Father God. And he said, I'll go. And I will bring them hope. And I will bring them, what was this one? Peace. See, good thing you're here. I would bring them joy, and I will bring them love. I will go and do that. And then we have the Christ candle that we light on Christmas because he has come. So don't let anybody confuse you about love. When you think of love, think first of the one who brought love to everyone. And then how that love that he puts in your heart, you can give to other people. It's, it, it doesn't cost you anything. And you know what you get back? Love. <laughs> You get back love. So, anyway, we got them now. Hope, right? Peace, Peace right? Yep. Third one? Joy. Joy. Fourth one? Love. Last one? Christ. Got it. You are great, I'm telling you. Father, thank you. Thank you for these dear children that you are placing in them hope that they can walk in in peace with you, Lord Jesus, that they can feel joy even when times are hard and that they can love in the true sense of what love loving means. And finally, because you reign in their hearts, 
You're there, that you are their Messiah, God. You're with them. You're Emmanuel with them. They know how to love. So, Lord, I ask you that you'd pour out your blessings upon them as they go and continue to prepare for next week. Bless them now, Jesus. Amen. See you guys. Okay. Hear now the invitation to the offering. Faithful and loving God, we offer to you ourselves and a portion of the blessings that you have bestowed upon us. Thank you that you call us to share in the work of your kingdom here on earth. Lord, bless each gift and each giver that both may be instruments in your hands to bring many souls to believe in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Amen. Okay, now time for to share our joys and concerns. About Friday, I was getting concerned, <laughs> but then I said, I could do this. God will get me through this. <laughs> but I was a little concerned that I would not be well enough to, to be here. These colds are brutal this year. They're very mean. Um, so i thanking God that uh, he brought me to a place where I can be here with you this morning. Any uh, other joys, concerns? Please leave a comment or send us an email with your joys and concerns, and we will pray for you. Okay, Father, first we come before you in, uh, with hearts thankful that we can come to you with these concerns and burdens. And that before we even say their name or whatever's happening, you know. You know exactly what's going on in each life. You know where they are, what they need. And you know that uh, what they need most of all is to know that you're there with them. That you walk them through this time. And whatever the end result may be, Lord, you're still in it. And you're still with them and with those that love them. And so for that, we are we're eternally thankful, Jesus, that you promised that you would never forsake us, that you would never abandon us, that you would never leave us to ourselves without, <clears throat> without being there with us. So uh, we lift these folks to you, trusting that you will meet, you, meet each of them at their very deepest need. Uh, and for all of them at this holiday season, it's so hard. What a, hard place to be uh, when it seems like everyone else is so filled with joy. Give them joy, Lord, joy, and give them peace that passes all of their understanding. They cannot understand it. They'll never understand it, but give them peace and give those around them, their family, their friends, those who care for them, give them that same peace that this is your time with them, that you are there and you will not leave them or forsake them. And so we thank you, Lord. We thank you for hearing our prayers and for the way that you will answer them. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Our scripture this morning is taken from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 through 11. Six through six, it's actually only six and seven. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. This is a word of God for the people of God. Isaiah, it always uh, amazes me. Uh, Isaiah is the, the messianic prophet. If you read the book of Isaiah, Jesus is everywhere in the book of Isaiah. You can't miss uh, seeing Jesus there. Uh, and I, I think of Isaiah, um, you know, the prophets um, didn't have easy lives because people looked at them like, mm, yeah, you're all right. What's up with you? They did not have easy lives. Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet. But they had something to tell to God's people directly from the very heart of God. And Isaiah listened, and he told them. And it, reading Isaiah is just... A, it's just a wonderful uh, experience. I, I love reading Isaiah 53. If you remember this, when you go home today, get your Bible out and read Isaiah 53. I, I was teaching one time a Sunday school class, and that was what the class was. I had them read Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 is a perfect description of our Jesus, beginning to end. It's just a perfect description. So I had them all read it, and then I asked them the question, and they you know, looked at me like, what, do you think we don't know this? But they did know it because it's so clearly Jesus. And more than any other prophet, Isaiah speaks of the Messiah. He calls, if, if the first 39 chapters, he pretty much sp spends time telling them, you guys better wake up and repent and start behaving yourselves because there's a judgment coming. And it's, it, there's, it's pricey what's going to happen to you. It's going to cost you a lot. And, uh, and then in chapter 40, it's, there's a switch. That's where it says, comfort. Comfort my people, says your God. And comfort comes. And the end of, of the book is filled with, with comfort and hope. And, and the knowledge that they can be forgiven for their sins. So today's scripture from chapter 9, it says, it starts out in the very first verse in chapter 9, it says, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of the shadow of death. A light has dawned. The darkness that the people of that time were living in was a, was primarily brought on them by, by their own sin. See, they had, this, they had kind of a form of godliness, but they did not have, they were not living out that in their hearts. In their hearts, they were corrupt. They gave in to the, to the, the ways of the world, the, the pagan ways of the world, and their faith. They, were, they had lost their faith. And so uh, Isaiah comes and he calls to them, and he's saying, there's, there's a child is coming. Get, get yourselves ready here. Get ready. And he tells them of the coming redemption. Unto us, unto us a child is born. He didn't say unto you. <laughs> when he said unto us, I really believe he was saying unto us, those in that time, that past time. Unto us, those here present. Unto us, those generations that will follow us. This Messiah was coming. And as the government will be upon his shoulders, in the state of the world today, every night, every night when I go to bed, I, I repeat that. 
all things are under God's hand. No matter what it looks like right now, he knows the things that are happening in our world are no surprise to him. He knows our hearts. He knows our, the, what we're made of. But it's such a comfort to me to know that maybe I don't see today in my government, in the government that stands over me, I don't see justice. You know, don't you get, I get a little tired when they always talk about justice and equality and, and all these things. And then they have programs. There is no program that will cause our government to be just to everyone. Because it's some, they, they don't know everyone. It slips by them. They don't know what our Lord God knows. So when he said this, he meant that their day is coming. And we'll all be there that day. <laughs> when, there is, when justice reigns and righteousness is there. And that's our hope. That's where we put our hope. In the day that will come when our Jesus will reign completely. And everyone will see it. You know, in, in uh, Philippians, this is what it says in Philippians. Okay, if I can unstick this, this would be good, yes. In Philippians, it says, uh, it's, he's talking about, Philipp, when Paul writes to the Philippians, he's telling them about Jesus, the attitude of Jesus' heart, what Jesus brought to us. And he's saying that we should have that same attitude, who being in very... It, this is Christ now. But we should have an attitude the same as that of Christ, even though being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made, but hum, made himself nothing. Taking the very nature of a servant, became a, being in made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient even to death on a cross. Therefore, Christ exalted him to the highest place. God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, and in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. We have a choice. We're in that in-between, the first coming and the second coming. And guess what our choice is? We can choose to bend our knee now. To bend our knee now. And to call him our Christ. Because one day, everyone, even those who have denied him, even those who have persecuted his people, one day when Jesus returns, every knee in heaven and earth and under the earth, under the earth, you know where that is, under the earth, every knee, in heaven, on earth, and in hell, will bow their knee. And that's where we are. We're, we're in the in-between place. We're getting ready. We're getting ready to celebrate this, this uh, holiday now, but we're getting ready for that great day that will one day come. And we may not be here to see it, but we'll get to take part in it because we'll be returning with him in the clouds when he comes to reign. So he has the ultimate rule, though. Always he has the ultimate rule. And every night I thank God for that. Boy, I, you know, you pray and you pray and you pray. And at the end of the prayer, you just have to say, thank you, Lord. You're really in charge anyway. You know, I, I've been reading, um, again, my devotion. And it keeps telling me that I got to stop this trying to arrange my life so it works the way I think it should. And we as people have to realize we have to do everything that is that God has called us to do but we have to understand that still we're in this place between the first coming and the second coming and then it says and his name shall be called wonderful counselor now that for, that those first that first name some translations separate it they say and his name shall be called wonderful comma counselor but in others, it, 
puts those two together. You know, really, it doesn't, it's no problem which way they put it, is it? Because he's both. He's wonderful, and he's our counselor. But he's a wonderful counselor. There's no counselor equal to him. There's, no, there's none equal to him. He, has, he stands without rival, without peer. He is the wonderful counselor. And you know what really awes me? Is that at any day, any time, any moment, any nanosecond of my life, if I have the good sense to turn to him and say, Jesus, I need you for this. I need your help with this. I need wisdom. I don't have that kind of... I'm, I just need your wisdom. Help me with this. And you know, he's not ever failed. He, sometimes he's told me to do things that I don't really think I, I want to do them that way. I've told you some of those stories, like the lady that left work because she was so mad at me and because I told her to do something. And, and then I prayed and God said, you need to write her a note of apology. I told you about that. That was the best thing I ever did. It resolved an issue that had res existed for a long time. We became friends. We stood together. We worked together. Now, would I have thought of that myself? No. Because I know, went to all those management classes. And I should not show weakness. That's the problem, you see. We don't want to show that we're vulnerable or that we're weak or that we don't have the solution. And pride takes the place. In the place of pride, we need humility so that God can do in us and through us what he's longing to do. He's the mighty God. And then it says, he, it, you know the neat thing about Jesus? You don't need to make an appointment. Right now, this second, every, there's no appointments with him. It's open. Every moment of your life that you need him, he's there. And boy, do we need him every moment. He is God himself, the one, the very one who spoke all creation into being and holds it together. It says, it says he's a wonderful counselor, the mighty God. This is our Jesus. He's the everlasting father. There's no time. Time belongs to him. We can't take this lightly, <laughs> this celebration. We really should take it very seriously. This is, uh, everything changed. The entire world changed. The dates changed. I, I uh, just recently heard Jonathan Kahn, who um, is, is a, I think, I believe he's a current day prophet. And, and he talked about before Jesus came, the paganism was incredible. So the sacrifice of, of children, the, uh, the, all the hills were covered with these pagan worshipers. They were, uh, they, he even talked about the fact that, uh, you know, the, the, he talks about the three kinds of God, gods involved, the gods that are involved that have returned, the possessor, the enchantress, you know, she, the, the, these hills were, were covered with, with enchanting women who drew people into sin. And, and then the, the last one is the destroyer. And he talks about those gods have come back. We see them at work in our lives. I kind of got off there, so now i got to find out where I am. But anyway, the thing is, the day when Jesus came into the world, the world wasn't a whole lot different than what it is now when he came. So last Sunday marked our beginning of, of Advent. And uh, as I told the children, Advent actually came into being early in the 4th and 5th century. And it was used as a time to prepare people who were going to be baptized at Epiphany. It had nothing to do with Christmas. It was a preparation time for those who were going to be baptized. And then the Roman uh, church or the Roman Christians made Advent part of, uh, of Christmas. 
and assigned the values to the candles and things like that. So, but his first coming, we celebrate as the coming of our redemption. That's what we're going to celebrate in a couple of weeks. Wow. <laughs> you know, the world doesn't know that. A lot of the world doesn't know it. I mean, they play the songs. I love going into the, to the stores where they're playing Christmas songs, not just have a holly jolly Christmas. But occasionally you do hear a Christmas song that we sing here in church. And I always think, boy, let the people hear it as they're so busy. Pierce through the darkness, Lord. Pierce through the darkness so that they can hear. So as we prepare for, for Christmas, I just wanted to take a, a little time to talk about, you know, the fact that uh, we've already know that Jesus has come the first time. And yet every year we repeat, the, we repeat what we've done before. Why do people repeat things? Why do we... Why do we celebrate birthdays? Every, you know, well, because someone gets older, and you, know, you can lay that on them. But birthdays are a celebration of life. Why do we celebrate Christmas? Christmas is a celebration of redemption. We've been redeemed. He came for our redemption to bring, him, bring us back. God with us, Emmanuel, God living in us. Emmanuel. And so we live in the time between. You know, the, uh, the first Christmas, we, I, I always love to uh, think about, I, in fact, I, I love to read it. And if you, you know, if, if it fits into your, the way you celebrate, I don't know, how many of you read the Christmas story again? You, reading it again and reading it with someone else and put yourself there. I, I, you know, the, the past, we can read the accounts of the first Christmas, you know, it's, and read it, but this time read it like it's the first time you ever read it, like you never read it before, or you never heard it before. We've gotten blasé. Oh, I know that. Oh, I know that. I know there were shepherds. Come on, I, I know all that. But go back and read it again. Go back and stand in the, as you read it, stand in the, in the dark, cold night in Bethlehem in the streets. Go back to the hillside where those poor shepherds were lying in the cold. And suddenly, and suddenly, think about that. What if, what if you went up and, and you stood on a hill around here? And suddenly, don't you love that phrase? Suddenly. Angels, light. Can you imagine those guys? I mean, think about it and try to put yourself in that place. Shepherds, the, the lowliest, the least, they were not considered worth much of anything. And then those kings that traveled so far that traveled so very far to come and to gaze upon that tiny baby, that tiny baby lying in a, uh, in a manger where the oxen fed from. Think of Mary and Joseph. Wow, they had, seen, had dreams and they had been told what was going to happen, and here they were. I'm, I wonder if they ever thought, gee, I didn't plan on it happening quite this way. But God was there with them. Emmanuel, Jesus came in that place to fulfill what Isaiah had said. You know, and then you read, if you read in, uh, I love this, I, you know, in Luke. This is one of my favorite, favorite, favorite uh, readings about the birth of Jesus. It says, now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. 
And so moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon looked up, took him in his arms and listened to what Simeon said. Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. He could go in peace now. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for the revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And then he tells Mary what she's did. A, a sword will pierce her heart one day. And it talks also here about Anna, who was married for seven years and her husband died. And then she spent the balance of her 84 years there in the temple waiting, waiting for the promise. When I think of how many people waited for so long and did not see the coming of the Lord Jesus, and here we are in the in-between, and we celebrate it every year. And I guess what, what I'm trying to say is sometimes we lose sight of what we're celebrating. If we could make more, more of what it really is about. We, it's been stolen away from us by the gods of merchandise, <laughs> by the power of profit. And, and, you know, like the kids were saying, it's become so commercialized that I talked to some people. I was talking to someone the other day, and, and she said, oh, my gosh, here it comes. This is Jesus. What do you mean, oh, my gosh, here it comes? Here it comes, the busyness. You know, three weeks of insanity. You know, Jesus said to Mary, Mary, said to Martha, remember Martha came and said, I'm doing all the work, and she's in here listening to you. And, and, and a friend of ours shared this recently with us. When he said, Mary has chosen the better thing, he didn't mean, Martha, you don't, you know, you're all wrong. What he went, was saying, and this is an interesting take, Martha, you don't have to make it that big a deal. Don't we make everything a big deal? We should make Jesus the big deal. Don't you think? He's the big deal. It's all about him. I saw recently uh, that young man who played the part of Jesus in The Chosen. Has anyone watched The Chosen? I, I have not myself, but he, uh, his name is Jonathan Rumi, Rumi or something like that. But it shows him on TV. He walks, into, he walks through the door, and his arms are full of packages. And he, and he briefly mentions something about the way Christmas is. And then he, he uh, drops it and he said, really, the important thing in all of it is Jesus. And I, I, know, I know it sounds like I'm really laying it on you here, but I want you to have a Christmas that's so blessed because he came. I want you to know the depth of the love that he has for you that he wants you to have hope. He wants you to have peace in your life. He wants you to have joy and love. Most of all, more than anything he wants from you is you. That's what he wants, you. He wants each one of us to come to him in our brokenness and our neediness in the midst of a dark world and say, Jesus, pierce the darkness for me. Show me the way to go. And let me walk with you faithfully, even in the midst of the hard things. I had a call yesterday from a, 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 a woman that I knew years ago at the Torrington Methodist Church. And she um, has just, uh, she knows a, a family whose little girl is now waiting for a heart transplant. And so she called me and asked me, if I would contact them. What a privilege for me. I was there. Now, God, if I, and I, you know, it was hard when she first asked me. I thought, oh, 
Oh, that's a hard place. But my God is full of hope and peace and joy and love. And he won't let me down and he won't let them down. And he may be able to use even me to walk with them through this time. That, uh, that astounds me. That just astounds me. That that's how Jesus works. He calls us. He equips us. And he goes with us. You know, the world we live in is pretty much the same as the world that Jesus came into. And the world we live in is as in desperate need of Jesus as that world was back then. You know, the future, well, we don't really know uh, when, you know, only God knows when Jesus will come again. There's a lot of scriptures that talk about the second coming. There's been books we've read. And some of what we read, and, you know, it's kind of hard. We, well, what's going to, you know. Here's the thing. When we look to the future coming of Christ, we always need to look through the prism of Christ, who he is. And he'll get us there, and he'll get us through that. And then we will, it says we're going to reign with him. We're going to reign with him. Astounds me. It's an astounding thing. So if we choose now to humble ourselves and bow our knee before him and confess that he is Lord to the glory of God, our waiting, our waiting for him to work in us and our waiting for him to come again will be filled with blessings. As we wait now for the coming of Christmas, the Christmas holiday, and for the future coming of Christ, we can call out to our Savior and ask him to walk through it with us. Our wonderful counselor, our mighty God, our everlasting Father, our Prince of Peace in the midst of so much chaos and war. It's not just the outward trimmings. And this is beautiful. My word, this is beautiful. Just bless me. To, I could just sit here all day and look at this. It's so beautiful. I, I, you know, I am not putting down the celebration of Christmas as, as I, I, you know, I can't wait for Christmas morning to sit in. Of course, they're 14 now. It's not the same. When kids stop opening toys, what happens, you know? I want to be able to put something together or play with something. Um, I don't want to try on their clothes. My goodness. It's a wonderful time to be together. It's a wonderful time for family. And I am not, dis I am not uh, trying to discourage you. I'm trying to encourage you so that it can be full. It can be full of him. And just as the candle says, the Advent candles say, our hope is in Jesus. Our peace is in Jesus. Our joy is in Jesus. Love is in Jesus. He was, he is, he will forever be all that we need. Years ago, I'm going to sing to you again. How about this, huh? Two weeks in a row. And singing. Years ago, there was a gentleman who used to come to our church, and and um, well, actually, it was a group of people that came to our church to share with us from over in Hartford, and they had written their own song. These were people who were in in uh, recovery from alcoholism and drug addiction and homelessness, and and uh, they came and shared with us, and they wrote their own song, and this is what it says. All that I need is in Jesus. All that I need is in Jesus. All that I need is in Jesus. He's everything. He's all that I need. Amen. Our closing hymn.
is we're to rejoice. It says good Christian men. It means all of us. All of us together. Rejoice. thing to remember that that's what we rejoice in that we are a people saved by the very love of God and one day we will reign with the king of kings and now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory and with great joy he will present you there to the only God our savior through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.